Actually, we're honored to have him here today. This is a phenomenal story he's going to tell us today. And uh, I know all of you, many of you came here today. This is one of the biggest crowds we've had in quite some time. We thank you for coming. Mr. Babcock, you got the podium. You got the con, Mr. Babcock. All right. That one don't work. So I'm going to have to set that back here. And, okay, let's make a decision. I've got 15 minutes. I got more than 15 minutes of material. You want me to fly like a son of a gun and get done? Or for those of you that have to leave early, just get up and leave when you have to, and I will run through. I'm not going to take four hours to do this, but uh, this is an important event, and I am, Pat Gartland, thanks for putting me on here today because we all know Friday is the 70th anniversary of the end of the war in Europe. And I'm proud to have a World War II Marine here amongst us. Uh, I am going to talk about one division, and we could pick any of the several hundred divisions that fought in Europe in World War II to talk about. But since I'm up here and I've got the 4th Division hat, I am going to talk about the 4th Division, and I'll tell you why that's a special division. How many of you have had the great honor of serving wearing this patch? All right, steadfast and loyal. Okay, so what we're going to... Did you all notice that good-looking young lady that was on the screen here a few minutes ago? That's my granddaughter. If anybody wants to know why I moved to Athens, that was the reason. Okay, VE Day comes up, and those who were there on VE Day, that guy's got a smile on his face, but they had just been through a hell of a fight. There wasn't a lot of joy on VE Day. It was more remembrance of those they lost along the way. It was thanking God that they could get back to their lives again. But what I'm going to do is just take one division and walk quickly through sort of how the war uh, worked for the 4th Infantry Division. It could have been the 101st, it could have been the 1st Division, it could have been the 9th Division. But this is representative, and I think it's appropriate that we Vietnam vets pay honor to the greatest generation today. The 4th Infantry Division started the war in 1940 down at Fort Benning, Georgia, when they were reactivated after World War I, had been deactivated. Uh, they went through the Louisiana maneuvers. They went through the Carolina maneuvers. They were a motorized division, experimental, and they were going to North Africa, but there weren't enough ships. So they said, heck with this, so they scrapped the motorized idea, and they said, you guys are going to do something more exciting. We're going to let you be an amphibious division, and you're going to go down to Camp Gordon Johnston, Florida, which is down in the swamps of the Panhandle, we're going to teach you how to land on landing crafts. January of 44, they went to England. They trained in England. And June 6, 1944, they were a key part of the invasion. Five divisions were in the assault. The 101st and 82nd jumped in. The 1st and the 29th divisions landed on Omaha Beach. The 4th division landed on Utah Beach, which is right here. And the 4th Division attacked north. And for years I said, how in the heck can you go from England to Europe and attack north? Well, the Cotonou Peninsula points back up north. So I learned that you can't attack north. So that was the assault. The, the Airborne came in. They jumped behind Utah Beach. Over here's Omaha, and then here's the British and Canadian beaches. H hour, 6.30 in the morning, the first wave hit on Utah Beach. A few minutes later, because of the tide, the uh, uh, 1st and 29th Division hit at Omaha. I'm not going to talk about them. And if you know the history, 
They landed 2,000 yards off target. They had been studying the terrain and they got there and determined that we're in the wrong place. Well, Brigadier General Teddy Roosevelt Jr. decided the war will start from here. So he, being a good infantryman that he was, took the worst situation. And interestingly, it was a good situation because where they landed on Utah Beach was not nearly as built up with Germans as where they had planned to land. The 8th Infantry Troops were the lead element that went in. 2nd of the 8th went in first, followed by 1st and 3rd of the 8th, and then 3rd of the 22nd was also earned the Presidential Unit Citation for that landing. And a little side note, one battalion of the 8th Infantry of the 4th Division is currently the reaction force in Kuwait, ready to do whatever they're asked to do right now. Utah Beach, unlike Omaha, was kind of a cakewalk. We lost 200, a little fewer than 200 people on the beach that day. The rest of the month was hell on wheels. Down the beach, Utah is way over there. Here's Omaha. This was taken from a uh, German bunker. You can see why Omaha was such a bloodbath. They had clear fields of fire out here, so I throw that in just for those of you who have not seen there. I've had the great honor three times I've been to the beaches, uh, and I was there for the 60th, led a group of World War II, Fourth Division vets, and really a great experience for me. And on D-Day, as we came across, the Germans had flooded behind the beaches, so this inundated area back there had been flooded so you had Terre Green and Uncle Red Beach. They landed, the 8th Infantry came this way, the 22nd went that way, the third ones to last was the 12th Infantry Regiment who was headed, I did a little right up the middle, headed for St. Mary Glees. You'll notice over here a little town, it's hard to see from this thing, a little town named Pookville. And a young captain named George Mabry decided he was with the 8th Infantry working for regimental headquarters. He decided, I'm going to go find the 101st. So right out here in this swampy area, he found General Maxwell Taylor with a bunch of his staff. And Taylor is said to have said that never has so many been, or, or so few been led by so many. So basically you had the staff and the CG and nobody else because as you know, the 82nd and 101st got scattered all over Hell's Half Acre there. After we got past D-Day, there was a 210 millimeter German battery, and you could see the thickness of the concrete, which was blowing the hell out of Utah Beach. It could also hit Point de Hoc. It could also hit Omaha Beach. The first mission of the 4th Division was to take out the Crisback and the Aysville batteries, and we lost a hell of a lot of people. We lost too many people, but we got the mission done finally. And today that stands as a, as a monument of the first big mission of the 4th Division as they were working up the peninsula. By the eighth day, the Quinville Ridge, you can see right here where we are. The 4th Division has got that area, the first divisions here and the British over here. And if you're if you're a history of World War, if you're a historian with World War II, you know the British weren't very aggressive. Montgomery was never one that people uh, thought highly of as far as aggression. So anyway, we had opened the uh, the beachhead, and by D plus 13, we had sealed across the peninsula. So the Germans up here at Cherbourg, which was our objective, the first deep water port we were going to take for the war, uh, they couldn't get away. And we had the 82nd, 101st, and a couple of regiments of, I don't know who that is over here. But by now we had the 9th, we had the 4th, we had the, uh, I can't read them all right now. You can probably see them better than I do. We had about five divisions in there moving north to take Cherbourg. It came at a high price. We lost 5,000 
casualties in the 4th Division during the month of June, between June 6th and uh, June 25th. A bloody, bloody battle. Uh, you don't know about that. All you hear about is bloody Omaha, where we lost so many on day one. Uh, so it moved on, and it was a hell of a fight going to take Cherbourg. When I was over there in September of 2010, a sergeant major, retired sergeant major from the 4th Division saw my hat and uh, took good care of us. And he said, Bob, we've got a, I want you to come up here with the flagpole with me. And we had a great honor of lowering the flag at the end of the day on the, uh, the American Cemetery above Omaha Beach. That's something I'll never forget. After we took Sherboard, we came down through the hedgerows, and the hedgerows, were, and we had to fight the hedgerows to get to Sherboard, and now we're still fighting them. The hedgerows was terrible. If you've ever been over there, they are fields, and these got all kinds of crap growing around them. I mean, it's tangled of trees, of rocks, of everything. American Ingenuity said, okay, because the tanks, when they'd come to a hedgerow, would come up, would put their soft underbelly and the Germans would knock them out with their Panzerfaust. Well, they put these tusks welded onto the front of those tanks so they would build, they would go into the hedgerow and bust on through. So that was a, you know, once again, American GIs. When we were in Vietnam, we had American ingenuity. Today's soldiers use American ingenuity. We are a unique people who think of whatever we need to do to get the job done. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Jr. was given command of the 90th Infantry Division. Uh, that guy was not doing a very good job. They relieved him. Before Teddy could take command, he died of a heart attack. Uh, this was the last picture taken of him. This is, uh, you've got Bradley, you've got uh, Patton, you've got General Hodges, you've got General Cameron, all right here. And then we had one man from every company, battery, and troop of the 4th Division paying homage to him. July 7th was when uh, Teddy Roosevelt died. He was buried in a temporary uh, Cemetery. Now he is buried at the American Cemetery in uh, above Omaha Beach. His brother is buried next to him. By late July, we had a pretty good front. Once again, the British aren't doing quite as good as we are, but we're still fighting in the hedgerows, and it's it's a very slow, painful battle. So Operation Cobra came up, which was going to be the biggest bombing in history. Thousands of bombers were going to blow the hell out of the Germans, and then we were going to have the breakout. Well, there was a minor little problem. They were bombing on a road and on smoke, and as the smoke blew, the, the bombers that came in kept bombing on the smoke, which was now over American lines. 800 American soldiers were killed by that friendly fire bombing. The highest ranking American general to be killed in World War II, General Leslie McNair, uh, Fort McNair in DC is named after him, was observing the bombing and was killed in that uh, in that bombing, and he's buried at the American Cemetery uh, above Omaha Beach. But breakout was successful. I mean, talking to people who were in that, they say the Germans were rattled like hell. Uh, Jim Stapleton and I had the great honor of serving in the 22nd Infantry Regiment in Vietnam. Well, the 22nd Infantry rode the tanks of the 66th Armor, part of the 2nd Armored Division, and basically were the ones that, that were the spearhead for the attack. We earned a presidential unit citation for that battle and uh, got out of the hedgerows so that we could start making a cross. If you know France, you can get further in and you get out of that hedgerow to more open country. 
The Germans were hurt more. I mean, we beat the hell out of the Germans all along there. The drive across Europe, we took off and we headed for Paris. And we got to Paris and it become politics. So they said the uh, French have to liberate Paris. Well, the French 2nd Armored Division was screwing around back there in the back and 4th Division was there ready to go in. So Omar Bradley said, the hell with prestige, tell the 4th to slam on in and take the city. Well, once the 2nd Armored heard about, French 2nd Armored heard about that, they sort of got the lead out of their ass and uh, came in. They got credit for liberating uh, Paris, but the first troops in there was Mike Hamer's unit, the 12th Infantry Regiment of the 4th, and it still pisses me off that we don't get credit that's due for us. But we know, don't we, Mike? Paris was liberated. Talking to guys who were there for that liberation, it was exhilarating. Most of us moved on. The 8th Infantry moved around. The 12th did stay there for a day or so. The 22nd moved straight through Paris on truck. Chaplain George Knapp, who died a few years ago at age 95, I published a book for, and he's got some great pictures that he took. He was one of the first guys to go to uh, the top of the Eiffel Tower upon liberation. I've got a bunch more pictures from him. Uh, just celebration. And uh, I guess I can tell this amongst a bunch of Vietnam vets. I had a uh, World War II guy said, if you looked out across those fields inside Paris around the Arc de Triomphe and the Eiffel Tower, he said all you saw were pup tents and there were a lot of females in those pup tents. <laughs> and he said, he said, if you didn't get laid that night, you had to be queer. <laughs> and I had a lady take real exception when I, I gave this talk down at the villages in Florida. She came up afterwards and said, how dare you to say that? Nobody's offended here, I hope. I wish I'd been there for that celebration. <laughs> Ernest Hemingway, Ernest Hemingway landed not on D-Day, but soon after D-Day, and he and the 1st Division get, didn't get along very well, so he headed on down the beach and found the 4th Division and took a liking to the 4th Division and followed the 4th and participated throughout the war. Uh, there's Ernest, and he took some French, foreign, or French resistance fighters into Paris before the uh, invasion into Paris, before we liberated Paris. He went in, checked out his favorite bar, came back and told General Leclerc, the second armor division, French second armor division guy, that, uh, hey, here's the situation. And Leclerc didn't appreciate it. And he brought charges against, uh, against Hemingway. So you'll find, if you dig into the archives, you'll find that Hemingway uh, was in deep water for he wore a weapon, and he went in, and the uh, French wanted him to. The story I heard was Patton told him just lie about it, tell him you weren't there. Uh, so anyway, the 4th Division moved on through Paris, and they fought across Belgium, and that was the 25th of August. Now here, on the 11th day of September, we always think of September 11 as when the terrorists hit the World Trade Towers. In 1944, September 11th, when the first American patrol went into Germany at the Siegfried Line, and it happened to be a patrol of the 4th Infantry Division, 22nd Infantry Regiment. Right, Jim? Where's, where's Tapeman? Is he gone? He's asleep. He had to leave. Uh, Siegfried Line, I told you about that. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel John Dowdy. John Dowdy was a young guy in his 20s. He landed on D-Day as a major, as a staff officer working in 1st Battalion, 22nd Infantry. He was wounded in June after having already earned the Silver Star and the Distinguished Service Cross. He came back just as they got to the Siegfried Line and 
was walking around make checking the positions of his battalion and the third time around the Germans got him and he was killed. Uh, DSC, two, two silver stars, two purple hearts, that was less than 30 days of combat. I wish I'd met that man. Speaking of Buck Lannan, the regimental commander, Buck also uh, earned a DSC in the Siegfried line, and he and Lannan became great friends. He and Hemingway became great friends. Uh, and if you ever read the book, Across the River and Into the Trees, about an old army colonel, that's Buck Lannan. Because Hemingway and Lanham, in fact, over at the University of Georgia Library, they have a collection of letters from Hemingway and a lot are between he and Lanham. So it's, a, once again, another tie to the 4th Division. And another one here, uh, Pierre Salinger. How many of you ever had to read Catcher in the Rye? Pierre Salinger was a, he works, or J.D. Salinger, J.D. Salinger, yeah. Excuse me, Pierre Salinger was later, wasn't it? J.D. Salinger was a, uh, uh, was on division headquarters. He was in the G2 section. Then after the hurricane, they screwed around in October. You remember we had, we ran out of gasoline. So we ran into a, sort of a lull in October and then we into the bloody hurricane force. A battle that never should have happened. One of the bloodiest battles of the war. I think nine American divisions fought through there. In early November, the 28th Division, the Bloody Bucket Division, was earning their name and were getting the hell beat out of them. About the 3rd Division at that point, they got beat up. The 12th went in to relieve them. The rest of the, battalion, the division came in on 16 November. 150% average casualties in a rifle company. Think about that. Once again, when I was talking to these people down in Florida, they said, how can you have 150% casualties? You ever heard of a replacement? Many of who got wounded before they ever got up to the line. The division would just beat to hell, but we made it. We made it through the force. We were the first division to make it through the force. We were relieved by the 83rd Division. Four of the five medals of honor earned by 4th Division soldiers in World War II were earned in the hurricane. Uh, George Mabry, Remember I talked about him ho hooking up as a captain with the 101st? Now he's a battalion commander, lieutenant colonel, who later went on to two stars. He was, he was a commanding general in, in Panama in 1968. Oh yeah, he stayed in. Yeah, he stayed in and he, in fact, his uniform is down at the National Infantry Museum. Mar uh, Macario Garcia uh, was a private Took, took out of three machine guns in the forest. Amazing. Another piece, and once again, this talks about the American soldier. Uh, in 1990, at 1994, I think it was, uh, John Ruggles, retired two-star, who was the regimental XO and then regimental commander of the 22nd Infantry Regiment, had this plaque made honoring a German officer who crawled out into a minefield to help a 4th Division soldier crying for help who was laying out there wounded. Uh, Lingfeld hit, hit a mine, killed him. Uh, but once again, you go over to the Hurtgen Forest today you will see that monument, that plaque. Finally, the 3rd of December, they said they pulled us out, the 83rd came in, and they're going down to Luxembourg where it's pretty easy. We need to rest and relax, get refitted. Uh, they had a 35 mile front for the division. They gave some people some passes and then December 16th hit. You know what December 16th is? The bulge. Right here is where the main thrust was with Piper, Momedy, you've heard about Momedy and Seth Beth, and you had two other thrusts. Biggest battle of the, bowl, of, of the war. And because of the bulge, you never heard about the Hurricane Force because this made such big news. 
but you can read on it. You know, the things you've heard about it is 101st being uh, circled at uh, Bastogne. You hear about Patton turning his army and coming up to Bastogne to relieve Bastogne. Uh, next to D-Day, the Bulge is the most well-known uh, battle in World War II. And you look at what we had there. We had four and two-thirds division with 83,000 troops covering 104 miles. The Germans had five armored, 12 and two-thirds division. Look how many tanks, 200,000 troops on a 60-mile front. No wonder they blasted through there so, so effectively. And it would they had the element of surprise. But by January 2nd, we had eight armored divisions, 16 infantry divisions, two airborne divisions, and the Germans were outnumbered. We had 3,200 in a regiment. They had 1,800 in a regiment. Uh, and while most people think, and Ronnie, I know you believe that, the 101st won the war, didn't they? You better not say yes, you son of a gun. Everybody thinks the 101st and the 3rd Army won the war. To include a lot of 4th Division guys, they always talk about, I was with Patton's 3rd Army. They were for about six weeks. Most of the time they were 1st or 7th Army. Nevertheless, what the key to success was the American defense was more tenacious than expected. The American soldiers, just like we did in Vietnam, just like our soldiers are doing today, we stood and fought. Some of them, like the 106th Division, got their ass kicked. They were fresh green troops, but people stood and they fought, and they fought, and they fought, and they delayed the Germans. And then we did not give them the road network they needed. The flanks, because the plan was they were gonna move the right, the, the north and south shoulder of the bulge with people protecting the flanks to cut off allied reinforcements. Guess what? It didn't happen. And then they didn't believe that we would react fast enough to make the uh, commitment of a reserve. They thought we would be too cautious. So that's what won it. Yeah, Patton had his place, and McAuliffe had his place, and 101st, and everybody played their role. You'll notice up here on the north shoulder, you had the 1st, the 9th, and the 2nd Division. Down here, you had the 4th, the 5th, and the 10th Armor. That's what bogged things down, which allowed all these other divisions to come in from the flanks and stop the Germans. So by the 26th of December, the day after Christmas, effectively the bulge was over. We kept fighting them for another several weeks, but it was, uh, we had them back to their own, where their starting place was by early January. This woman right here, uh, the guy next to her is a good friend of mine who I've stayed at his house in St. Marie de Mont and he and I led the tour groups together. His mother was a 10 year old kid and she talks about how great the American soldier was in comparison to the, uh, to the German soldiers. Uh, she said, we were, we were really scared during the bulge because the Germans were so, were so mean and they got meaner as the war went on. Uh, but it was real interesting sitting and talking to her and listening to her perspective. Bastogne, just so we would, Ronnie, you know this thing. You probably have it tattooed on you, don't you? You know, here they are, the blue lines, the good guys, and you see all the red lines, and sure enough, they were surrounded. And right here is the 501st Parachute Infantry Regiment. And I've published a book for a guy that just turned 90, uh, Vince Speranza, he is having the time of his life going around and talking about being a 19-year-old machine gunner with the 101st in Bastogne. And I'm not here to plug a book, but if you want to read a fascinating story about a guy who at 90 years old has been to Bastogne about a, two, about a dozen times over the last six years, uh, it, it's a good read. I talked to him yesterday on the phone. He's just full of piss and vinegar. He said, Bob, I can't believe how much fun I'm having. And if you ever get over there, the headquarters for the 101st is still an active Belgian Army post. 
I took a tour there, took a half a day. It's fascinating to go through there. They have all kinds of stuff. Here is the office where McAuliffe was, where he uh, issued his famous nuts. And I've got a bunch more pictures, which I don't have in here. Around Bastogne, you've got all kinds of monuments. And it's, there was 27,000, 2,700, 2,700 Americans buried here in a temporary cemetery. This building right here had, had several hundred bodies because remember how cold it was and the fight was still going on. This building was full with American KIAs before they could bury them. Uh, they finally got German prisoners to bury them later on. The German cemetery just across the street from the uh, American temporary cemetery, uh, and it's very sobering to walk from this now open field that was the American cemetery to the permanent field. And I've never been in a German cemetery. I mean, the Germans do as good a job as we do taking care and paying honor to their uh, killed soldiers. The Luxembourg Cemetery, that's where Patton is buried. You know, here's his grave looking out across the troops. Uh, and everywhere you go, here's Hill 313, where a company, I think it's A Company of the 12th Infantry, fought over here in one of the towns. Uh, they all appreciate the Americans and what they did. If you want to read more, it's a great book, uh, Battle of the Bulge book. You can get it online. It's free, Center of Military History. Uh, you can read it. It's got maps and pictures. Patton. After the 4th Division had been going there, he talked about depleted entire division, you halted the left shoulder of the German thrust. Think back, it was stopping the shoulders is what let our reinforcements come in and save the day. We started a counterattack in 45 in January. Uh, our last major battle, we went back through the same Siegfried Lang places. In fact, I talked to guys that said I stayed in the same foxhole that I dug in September when they were there in uh, late January, early February. Prune uh, was the first major German town they took. They made The Germans made a stand there and uh, blew the hell out of that town. But we went on, then we, we started rapidly moving through Germany. In, in late March, we got a two-week stand down for the first time since June 6th, the 4th Division, pulled back to refit and get a little rest. Uh, and then it got to VE Day. And VE Day, the 70th anniversary, is Friday. Let us all remember that. And you all remember Helen Denton, who oh, has spoken to us. Helen is the seventh person back here on this right flank in Paris. She talks about the joy of that uh, VE Day uh, celebration in Paris. Here's the casualties we had. By month, June, November was our second biggest. Total battle casualties, 21,000, non-battle, you know, accidents do happen. 34,000, of course, from one division. So, freedom is not free. They came home in July, early July. Guess what? We're going to Japan. We're going to invade Japan. Thank God for the atomic bomb. They expected one million casualties. So you can bet that when these guys were on leave, and the bombs dropped, they were ecstatic. They came back to Camp Butner, North Carolina, and uh, most of them got out of the Army. Since then, in 1946, the 4th Division was deactivated. They brought them back in 47. They were the 1st Division. They go back to Germany in 1950. Uh, we fought in the Central Highlands from 66 to 70 in Vietnam. They were the Experimental Division. They captured Saddam along with special operations forces. They've had four tours in Iraq, one in Afghanistan, plus brigades going over, and we got a brigade, as I said, in Kuwait right now. And the chief staff of the Army, you'll notice, wears 
that good looking patch that I wore, Ray Odierno, who is just as proud of this division as I am. That's it. I'm sorry I talked so fast and we're so late on this thing, but you have any questions? Bob, yes, sir, Rick. One, one thing, uh, you know, Bob is the historian for the fourth ID. He has really represented us well as a Vietnam veteran. When I was in D.C. and met General Odierno, he talked about the ABBA and, and Bob, and then when I was at Dick Cody's retirement, the same thing with the, uh, Thurman, General Thurman, who said, hey, Rick, tell, tell Bob I need one of his books. And uh, it really is great that he's represented us. And another thing, if you remember the ceremony we did at the History Center to dedicate our Veterans Park, we were trying to come up with an idea how to disperse our sacred soil. And uh, Bob had told me about they used a helmet that uh, uh, Colonel Ruggles had given them. He wore a short Utah Beach. And they had used it to dedicate a, a Fourth ID memorial. And they put sand in it for every, every place the Fourth ID served. So I said, let's do that here. So we used that very helmet that was worn short at Utah Beach and the hat my dad wore short at Omaha Beach to, as the vessels to collect all the sacred soil at the History Center and disperse it from there. But that was a great idea. But the other thing is, Jim Stapleton said to make sure I tell you this, in Vietnam, Bob tried to uphold the tradition of the 4th Infantry Division. He carried his pup tent into every village they fought in, hoping that he'd be able to celebrate like those 4th IDs before him. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I tell you, I, I am going to be at Fort Carson, Colorado, next not this week, but next Thursday for a change of command. I love it because the Fourth Division calls me when they want to know something about history. I was invited out in January, and I spent a week teaching corporals through captains the history of our great division, and I had them for two and a half hours, so I could go here forever. Yes, sir. I just got a little side note on the cemeteries that I found out a couple of years ago. The Germans are the only country that do not maintain their cemeteries. They're maintained by the German Veterans Organization. Oh, are they? Yep. Okay, well, they do a hell of a job. I mean, yeah, those they are do. Well, yeah, just like ours are. All the other cemeteries are maintained by their own government. Yeah. Huh. Yes, sir. They came to Fort Lewis in 1956 when they came back from Germany after Cold War duty from 50 to 56. Then we were at Fort Lewis from 56 until 66. I was on the first boat that left. It was not the first boat, the engineers were on that. I was on the first infantry boat that left, as was Stapleton. Yes, sir. What does it mean by experimental division? Experimental division is the Army needs to try something out so with the, with the motorized division in World War uh, II, we were the experimental motorized division. In Force 21, they were trying all of this electronic gear and new tactics. And in 1995, they were assigned between 95 and 2002 as Force 21, and thus when the war in Iraq started. They were the ones that were picked to come through Turkey to make the attack from the north. And of course, because of politics, they didn't get to do it. But they came in with all this FBCB2 equipment, you know, crap that we wouldn't understand. This stuff is way above my pay grade to understand. Of course, I have seen it. And you know, they can sit here, you know, you always wondered who was on your right and left. They know that stuff. They've got they're all on all this equipment. I mean, it's phenomenal. And then after the first year in Iraq, they reorganized first the 4th Division where they took a battalion, for instance, a combined armed battalion, had two infantry companies, two armor companies, and an engineer company. The 4th Division was the first one they experimented with on that, and then they quickly did it with everybody. So uh, that's what it is. and. Uh, Yes, sir, Ronnie. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit for the rest of the people, what you did on the uh, Mr. Shielders store deployment of the board ID and what that little initial email moved to? How many people you sent that to? Running this letter. Yeah. Uh, a life changing event for me. 
In May of 2003, I went out on the 4th Division website and we had all of these family members saying, what's going on with the 4th Division? You're hearing anything because there was no letters coming, there was no email, there was no phone calls. They were over there in Iraq and nobody could tell anything. Well, I've been following the news regularly. I mean, I'm out digging through crap all the time. Plus, I've got contacts with a bunch of people in the 4th Division who are back channel telling me stuff they probably shouldn't have, and I had sense enough not to tell secrets as did they. So I sent our webmaster a note, and I said, I may be opening Pandora's box, but if these people want to send me their email address, I'll send them what I have. Within the first hour, I had 87 requests. For seven days a week, I did that 18 hours a day. And I had 30,000 people getting it by the end of that first deployment. And a lot of people, a lot of the guys in here got it. And as a consequence, Ray Odierno and I and his wife, Linda, are lifelong friends, as are many of the, I, I could do things like when they, the mamas and some of the wives, mo mostly the mamas were getting, little Johnny's not getting enough water. What do you mean little Johnny's not getting enough water? Well, he says I only get one bottle of water a day. I said, bullshit. There is water in a rack he may not get, you know, all he's got to go to the Lister bag or the water buffalo, for God's sake. Some of these mamas were going to ship water to Iraq. So I came in, I wrote a letter, I said, listen, you folks are crazy as hell. And if you do this, you're an idiot, because the Army would not send people to a place where there's not ample water. I hear from Linda Odierno, the brigade commander's wives, and all the others say, thank you, Bob. I wish the heck we could say that. So I was the voice for a lot of crap that needed said that could. So when they went over the second time, I said, I'm not going to do this again. Until they started saying, you got to do it. So the next time I did it three days a week. The next time they went over, I did it two days a week. And I'm still doing odds and ends. I mean, it's, it's a life changing thing for me, something I have enjoyed. And I wouldn't take anything for it. One more question. One more question. One more question. Nope. 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 Yes. Oh, come on. Somebody's got to, for God's sake, there she go. Save it. You did not mention Thomas Howie, Citadel graduate. I did not mention who? Thomas Howie, the major of St. Louis. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They carried him in. They carried him in. He wasn't a 22nd guy. I only know the details on the people of the 22nd. Yeah, he was an 8th Infantry guy. Yeah, I know the story, and I, you know, I, I know more stories on 4th Division that I could tell, but y'all have to be sitting here forever. Thank you very much. All right, guys, thank you. Um, I want to, I just, just a comment. Um, you know, we have some great speakers, but I'll tell you, I watched you guys today. Not only is he a great um, a publisher in what he does, but a great speaker, and you're a great story uh, storyteller too. We really, I really enjoyed this. This is really great to have, and I'm so glad you came. And we do get to honor you with one of our uh, special plaques here today. All right, and I'm too tight to buy one. No, it's okay. You got it. He did a great job. Let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you. Oh, great job. Great job.